was so excited last year when we rolled out the speaking assignments for 2024 because we're a planning church, so we plan it all in advance, and I got assigned today, and today was called Pastor's Choice, meaning it's not in a series, and that meant I can just do anything I want up here, <laughs> sort of, and I started pray, praying right away, Lord, what would you have me speak on? What do you want to say to the congregation? And I got it all set, and and by February, I had the sermon done. I'd done the research. I dug in. I mapped it out. I was so excited about it. And that's where it stayed. The materials weren't due yet, so I had all this extra time. And then God changed his plans. On April 19th, we were at home, my wife Heather and I, in our small group. And I'm teaching out of the book of James. That was their request. And the very first part of James is a challenge to people. And it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials of various kinds. And so I thought, okay, we'll just race through this. And we got stopped right there. We got stumped right there. We were just looking at each other going, how does that work? How do, how do you even do that? Because we take it serious. And I was thinking, well, when have I last had a serious trial? And I thought, oh, yeah, two weeks ago I was out fishing in the engine on my motor broke, and I thought, well, that's pretty serious, and I don't know how I'm going to deal with that, and that's what I was thinking. How am I going to find joy in a broken motor? Well, two nights later, my wife Heather and I were home eating dinner, and something happened in a blink of an eye that changed everything. It was like a bomb dropped on our house, like a train ran through our house. I'll tell you more about it in a little while this morning. But let's look at those verses I was referring to. It's in the first part of the book of James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. I thought it'd be appropriate to teach on this because nobody here or watching online or who watches it later could say, Really, I've never had a trial, or I won't ever have a trial, or I'm not in one now. Now, that, that's real for us, isn't it? It's real. Well, let's look into this James and this book of James to get a little context. James was the half-brother of Jesus. And while Jesus was traveling and preaching and doing the work of God, miracles and all that, James and his brothers didn't give him full respect. In some ways, they actually condescended to him and put him down. But when Jesus was killed on the cross, buried in the tomb, and he was resurrected, and he met with all of them. James was all in. He got it. And he was the first leader of the church in Jerusalem. And so why would he write at the start of the book of James? The very start. It's a beautiful book. Why would he say, consider it pure joy and mention various trials? Because at that time, there was persecution going on all over with Christians who were Jewish Christians who had scattered. And the persecution was already happening, sometimes from other Jewish Christian believers. I mean, if you want to know more about what this persecution would look like, think about Paul when he was Saul. He was anointed leader among the Jewish hierarchy, and he was sent on missions to ruin Christians' lives, you know, taking their homes and their livelihood and putting them in jail and just making their lives miserable. Well, that's was happening to Christians all over the world. And so James says right away, we, I got to let you know, I know that this is happening. And then he says, what is joy? And he says, what is pure joy? Well, it's important that we know joy is not the same as happy. I hear a lot from Christians, doesn't God want me to be happy? Or, you know, I read the Bible and I think it, you know, God says I should be happy. Well, I hope he does make you happy. But happiness itself is a sense of pleasure and a transient state. It comes and it goes. But I know what God does want is us to be lots of things according to his holy word that guide and direct who we are to be and how we are to be. But happy isn't in there. I don't see it in here. But joy is. And what, so, so pure, let's look at pure joy. Pure means I was free of contamination. I worked in a foundry years ago in City of Industry, Southern California. 
go by the vat where they melted all these metals and, and periodically scrape the top off, and that was the impurities. So pure means free of contamination. And joy is a sense of well-being, meaning that there's something greatly valued and appreciated, and it's characterized by contentment and satisfaction. And I realized that once I let go of needing to be happy in a trial and look for joy instead, the search parameters changed. They just changed, and they've changed to this day. And I'm no longer focused on gaining that inner state of happiness and pleasure. I'm focused on something much deeper and richer than happiness, and that's joy. And you know what it reminded me of? My grandkids, one of whom was singing this morning. With the five grandkids here in town, I began with the oldest grandkid. When each one hit between two and three years old, I would pick them up on Friday morning, take them to Whole Foods, get a snack, then go down to the beach. And at the beach, there were two things I wanted to teach them. One was how the ocean works. So to this day, if I asked any of them up here and said, what's the most important thing when you go down to the ocean? Never turn your back on the ocean. That's what they would say. Next was I, I would tell them, let's look for beach glass. And they're like a lot of people. They're looking for half a bottle, a big chunk of glass. And they're going, well, there isn't any here. There's none here. I said, well, get a little closer. Get down a little closer. And if you look, and especially after water comes in and it goes out, everything sparkles. And what you'll find, I have bags and bags of beach glass. And the little pieces are as sparkly and wonderful as the big pieces. But you have to get down there. You have to look, and you have to be patient, and you have to move things around and sift to find it. And that's what I realized what I was going to need to do to find joy in the midst of a trial. And what does it mean when it says of many kinds? Well, what did it mean then? What does it mean now? Well, back then, there was persecution of Christians but there were also hard times and trials for everybody. There could be famine, illness. There could be occupying forces that, that ran rampant through the country. There's all kinds of trials back then that are very similar to trials we have now. And there are at least three categories of trials. There might be a hundred, but there's at least three. One is the trials I can know about ahead of time. Think of a hurricane. If you live on one of the coasts in America that has hurricanes, you get a warning. It's coming. Board up your windows, stock up on supplies, or get the heck out of Dodge, right? But you get two, three, four days notice. How about tornadoes? Maybe it's a little bit less notice, but there's warning sirens in the towns. Many people have shelters they can go to. Not so with earthquakes. How many of you have been in an earthquake? That means you've lived in California for a while, doesn't it? I was in L.A. during many earthquakes, born and raised there. I was in Loma Prieta here, and it comes out of nowhere, no warning. And then there's the trials that other people do. I was at a stop sign up in the Bay Area years ago when I lived there, and in a suburb, all by myself, no traffic that I could see, and wham, somebody ran me from the back. That caused a whole series of events. Go to the doctor for my neck, insurance claims, get the truck fixed. There's all kinds of of trials. And one of the hardest things about a trial is uncertainty. Not knowing from why it happened to what's going to fix it to what's the future hold, given that we now have this stressor and this trial in our life. And I can testify that it's one of the worst states to be in as a human being. I don't like it any better than anybody else. And see, God in his mercy, in our great design as humans, he built into us what, what I call an auto-response, meaning whenever we hit a hard time of stress and pain, we want instant relief and immediate escape. It's just natural. There's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just our build, and that's me. I want to know. Here's what I want to know. I want to know, why is this happening? Why is it happening now? Why is it happening to me? And when's it going to be over? What do I need to do to fix it? When's it going to stop? If, if it's not stopping right now, tell me when. That's what I want to know. That's how we are. That's how we're built. 
And then in this verse is also testing of your faith. Well, I, honestly, I don't like this test. I just don't like it. <laughs> because it's testing my faith. How does it work? How does a trial make a test? Well, I can tell you how it works for me. We can easily, me and others, maybe you can be tempted to fall into this, this, this pathway that goes off this way, um, doubt, despair, hopelessness, and frantic thinking. And in the world of psychotherapy, I'm also a psychotherapist, we call it catastrophizing. You've heard the word catastrophe. That means the worst thing ever. And there's a way of thinking that we can fall into that's called catastrophizing, and I do that. One of my dear colleagues in my practice in the Bay Area is a psychologist, David Dane. He says, D, you catastrophize all the time. I said, I've never heard of that. I think you made it up. <laughs> but he was right. And here's what it means. When I'm catastrophizing, my thinking sees no purpose in the trial other than it has to stop for me to get anything out of it. I can't get anything out of it now. It's got to stop. Then I can review, reflect, thank God, do all those things. That's what my brain does. Is that just me or anyone else? <laughs> chuckle, chuckle, I get it. But you know what can really happen too for a believer? It can lead to questioning God himself. God, why are you doing this? Or God, why are you allowing it to happen? Why? I mean, I go to church, I tithe, I believe, I, I, I go to Bible study, I volunteer, I serve. Why? Why? And here's the reality. In the Bible, there's no evidence that the most devout of followers of Christ escape the trauma and trials of this world. Sometimes we think that. I'm a good Christian now, so things should mellow out. I won't have any more troubles. That's, it's not taught here. What's taught is we have answers and strength in our time of trouble. I remember going through this with my son, Connor, when he went off to college. And Connor, he went down to Southern California, and I have to say he got involved in the classic college stuff. I don't know, broke his arm, skateboarding downhill at midnight. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> I didn't find out later. He wouldn't tell me. But I would call Connor and I'd say, Con, how you doing today? He goes, oh, pub, I'm okay. I said, no, tell me. How you doing? How you really doing? Oh, well, it's hard. You know, I'm out of money for a while till the third. And, um, you know, I kind of think I got a cold or something. I don't know what it is. And he'd go down the list of troubles. Then he'd say this to me. He says, pop. He still calls me pop to this day. He says, why is this happening? And I would say to him this, which he uses now. I'd say, what's the real question? He goes, ugh, why did I think it wouldn't happen to me? Where did that come from? And I thought that too, and I think, why is this happening to me? And my brain shifts right over to, why did I think this thing should or shouldn't happen or wouldn't happen? Who am I to escape anything in this world? And the answer is nobody. I'm nobody to escape it. We don't get to escape it. But I can answer the why question, at least from the book of John. Here's what Jesus says. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So that's the question I raised with myself eventually is why did I think this should never happen to me? So on April 19th, that Friday night, the small group, we challenged each other on how do we find pure joy in the midst of these trials. And my Bible says, whenever you face various trials, but I chose in the midst of, because other Bibles say in the midst of, and that's what I want to capture, when you're in it. Little did I know, two days later on Sunday, um, in a blink of an eye, the life of my wife and I, Heather, changed dramatically. We were on the couch eating dinner, and she had a salad that was a few days past the due date. It smelled good, but she ate it. And then she said, I got this pain right here. And then, then she was doubled over in agony. She goes, I have to go into the bathroom. And she lost her dinner and it was awful. Then she went into the bedroom and she laid down. I think I might feel, oh my gosh. And it got worse by the second. And soon she was on the floor and she was retching violently. 
and it wouldn't stop. So I'm there, I'm right there. I'm going, okay, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And then her eyes rolled up and then she couldn't use her legs and then she was covered with sweat and I went, this is really, really bad. And, and uh, then she whispered to me, she could barely whisper, she says, I think I'm dying. I called an ambulance right then. I was scared. Usually I can figure stuff out, but I couldn't figure this out. And so the ambulance came and they took her to ER and I told them I, she had this salad. I think something happened and she had a pain and they were treating it like extreme food poisoning and people get that and can have a strong reaction. Then they did a CAT, CAT scan and they found this monster kidney stone, which can cause all that retching and all that we didn't know. Her blood pressure when she was admitted in the ER was 233. And you're saying, oh, because you know. That's bad. Doctors came running. So there she is. She's got seven drips going. Stitched in ivy here. Stitched in ivy here. Ivy here. Everything. And she's got vertigo. She can't turn her head more than an inch either way without getting incredibly sick and dizzy. And so doctors are coming in and saying, what is this? What's going on? What is this? She's not really responding except we got fluids back in her and they said, well, it's, you know, this horrible food poisoning, but now we know there's a kidney stone. So got the blood pressure down, moved her over on the floor into a regular hospital room the next day. And one doctor came in and said, you know, I can't figure this out because she's in just all this pain. Hour after hour, they could administer a little pain through the painkiller through the IV, but it only helped for a little while. She's just moaning in agony. I can't do anything about it, you know? And this one doctor's going, I think we need an MRI. And sure enough, the morning after she was moved to the floor, they did the MRI and the neurologist came in, a neurosurgeon came in, everybody came in. They showed us a picture. She'd had a cerebral hemorrhage in her brain. There it was, the ugly reality of it. That changed everything. He moved her into ICU. And for the next six days... She was in ICU, just, they're just trying to get her stabilized and everything working. And um, I was there, the visiting hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so I was there, um, you know, as much as I could be. But going home was hard for me. I wanted to be with her because one of the doctors had kind of let me know that had I not been home that night, she would have died. So on those nights, I was home, and there's a title of a book written centuries ago called Dark Night of the Soul. And we love each other very much, so I was walking around the house I'm just saying, Lord, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do it? How? This house is about us. This is our life here. So she wasn't sleeping in ICU. If you've ever been in ICU, you know that nobody sleeps in ICU. It just, it's not designed for that. It's designed for intensive medical care. I didn't sleep at home either. And then I came back and I saw her all differently and then I realized I almost lost her. And, and I gotta tell you, day one in the ICU, Heather's talking to me as best she can and she, she said this, she said, you know what? This isn't about me and my suffering. And she was in agony. It's about God, he's all over this. He is in this right now. And I'm going, okay, I, all right. And she's leading me in seeing his presence in this and, and finding joy in it. She goes, I, I'm just learning and I'm, I'm growing right now. And then she'd moan. I mean, she was in agony hour after hour for 12 to 14 days. And she kept repeating that. They couldn't take care of the kidney stone because of her blood pressure. So they just medicated, but it was hours every day. And so... I got bogged down. I was a caregiver. I was without sleep. I was walking around like a zombie. And I finally went out in the car. Once she was home, 
uh, taken care of in the living room, which I converted into a hospital room. Uh, I sat out in the car and I called my favorite therapist, my son. He is a licensed therapist and a pastor. Who knew? <laughs> and he was so helpful, so helpful. That conversation Heather and I had in the midst of is a conversation we still have every day. And every day we remind ourselves of all the ways God has given us joy in the midst of this, and we're not done yet. And I have to say, I am so sorry because many of you have been there and it didn't turn out with a full recovery. It didn't go that direction. And I've, I'm sorry, I am. I'm just thankful that the Lord decided not to take her. And he did that. But our conversation is still going on and it, it's two steps forward and one step back. He is in this in what ways? What ways is he in this? Let me tell you what ways did not get us through. Happy thoughts, being positive, one day at a time, using our brains to come up with solutions, luck, deep thoughts, deep breathing, yoga, meditation, chanting, healthy eating, and so on. All these things can be very, very helpful and useful, but they fall far short of the power of Christ within us. Our kids rallied around, four kids. They rallied around and, and, and some were in the hospital with us and I'd meet with them daily and, and it was beautiful. I could sense them drawing closer together and bonding and I could go from that meeting by the koi pond at Chomp with the kids because she couldn't have visitors and go in there and tell her about the visit and she'd say, oh, it brings me so much joy, so much joy. New bonds forged in the midst of this. Friends rallied around us and are still rallying around us. And that brings us great joy and we're not done with this yet. Heather and I were rebuked by some family members because they were offering help, meals, the other stuff. We said, no, no, we're fine, we're fine. You know, can I tell you something this morning? Don't be that person. If you're going through something and you got a trial, let the body help. Let the family help. Let people help you. I am one who doesn't like that. But I have learned through this, I have learned to be grateful. We're now humble and grateful. One of our care team staff members, Christy, she texted and said, we want to put you on the meal train. And I went, no, 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 we're fine. She essentially rebuked me. Would you just let people do stuff? People want to do stuff for you. Well, okay. We got some great food and some great dishes out of this. <laughs> you know what we did throughout this and what we're still doing? We're using our magnifying glass to look closer and find the joy, like looking for beach glass. I'm telling you, if you do that, you will find it. It is there if you see it. And you don't go down this dark trail of despair and catastrophizing. If you say, just let me look for it. We found the power to keep faith and hope alive and we still do daily. Let me tell you some of the things that have come out of this. It gave us hope. But here's some things that are happening. My wife got a new physician that a dear friend recommended and that physician her hit it off for her ongoing care. And as I mentioned, I was home when this happened. I could have been on a dive trip. I could have been on a mission trip and she'd be gone. She'd be in the arms of Jesus. But I would have been crushed, crushed. And a dear friend who's here right now was working in the hospital throughout and he would look at the chart and he'd get the sense of it. And he'd come in and encourage Heather, encourage me. And we're saying, oh, praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. We learned... We did learn all over again, not just to live one day at a time, but live moment to moment, hour to hour. And talk about everything in stark relief, everything consecrated. It was amazing. Everything is concentrated. We learn to see each day as a gift. In the Psalms, we read, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We began to see each day as a gift. I've always thought that and talked about it, but now it became 
hardcore reality for us. This is a gift. Here I am in front of you because Heather and I, and she'll be here at second service. We got a gift today. It was called today. I encourage you to see that. And then the friends, as I mentioned, brought the food. I've tasted things and I'm gonna make some into recipes for going forward. The last thing I wanna mention about things that happened for us, so many, is the leaders at Shoreline, Pastor Sean and Pastor Kevin, and, and on our directional team, Keith and Donna and everybody else said, you do whatever you need to do to take care of Heather. Don't worry about anything else. We got it. And I knew it was real and I felt freed up because I carry the weight of my responsibilities heavy. And they said, no, 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 right, not right now. And I'm so grateful for that. So our conclusion, God is all over this and we have a ways to go. And folks, here's the most important part of this. There's nothing special about Heather and I. We're not like more spiritual than most people. We're not, yeah, you know, we grasp the Bible better than you do. We're not God. Right, there we go. Anyway, there's nothing special about us. We are believers. I happen to work at Shoreline. So we're in the kingdom and we have a church, a home church that you have. And if you're just visiting today or you've been coming but you've not yet joined, you can have. Those of you at home too, you can have a home church. And I was thinking the other day, talking to staff about the message, I said, you know, my heart hurts for people who don't. Or, or maybe people who just come and it's, they like the music and a message and then they go. But when a hard time comes and the trial comes, there's no pure joy because there isn't the community there. And so we now weren't treated because, well, I'm a pastor and my wife was on staff. We're just Dennis and Heather going through a trial and people stepped up to the plate in this community as Heather and I have done and will do. And this is for all. And if you've not yet invited Jesus into your heart, then that's the starting point. His arms are open wide. I just gotta tell you, his arms are open wide. He's got a great church full of his children who want you here, who want you with them to celebrate and rejoice with you and mourn with you and come alongside of you when you suffer, when you go through these trials of many kinds. I just, I don't know if I could adequately convey to you how much we want you in this family. If you're not already, please open your hearts to that. We want you to know how good the Lord Jesus is and how he wants to be with you walking with you through everything. And, and for Heather and I, it's been a refuge. We are still in a refuge. It says in the book of Nahum, Old Testament minor prophet, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. So in a tornado, people go to a shelter. And so we went into our refuge, which is him, to survive the storm. And eventually, as you come out, you begin to see, Co, where can we start to rebuild? Where can we regain and rebuild? And what can we do when these trials happen to us? What can you do? What are we doing? What can you do? James writes further along in the fourth chapter of the book of James, he writes this. Come near to God or draw near to God and he will come near to you, draw near to you. What is coming near? What is drawing near look like? What does that look like? It's not rocket science. It's not. First, come. Come. Come worship. Learn and grow. Make friends. Join a small group, a Bible study. Join one of the teams that volunteers regularly. Just come. And in doing so, you can become known to the body. We all want to know that we matter. True story. We all want to know that we matter. And we all are born with a need to belong. 
come. And third, study his holy word. There's nothing like this book in all of human history. It sells so many books each year, they don't even track the sales. When you read New York Times bestseller list, uh uh-uh, this is it. It will never stop because it isn't our book, it's his book. And he wrote it through those whom he selected to write his holy word to us in this book. Let yourself study it more. And it's about faith, hope, and love. See, that's what makes trials different for Christians. We have him, we have community, we have support, and we have truth. Jesus doesn't say, I tell the truth. He says, I am the truth. We have that truth. We have opportunities for growth and maturity if we choose to see it. If we, if we look for the beach glass, if we look for the finer things, we'll find the joy in our life. We have it all. We already have it all. And nothing on this earth can take it from us because nothing on this earth gave us the things that matter most. He did, and he still does to this day. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, I <laughs> Heather and I are still in it, and many here are in it also, Lord, and I don't know what it is, but it's something, and many here have suffered through or are suffering through a situation where it it won't end well in terms of recovery. It'll be painful and difficult. I pray you administer to them, Lord. Bring the power of your Holy Spirit and your comfort and your peace and your kindness and a way forward and let the body surround them. Let the body offer them compassion and care and comfort and let them open themselves up and receive it as you've counseled through others for Heather, my wife Heather and I to do. We're all in. I pray that they will be all in too for all that you have for them, no matter what these trials are of various kinds. Lord, make your presence know and offer them pure joy in the midst. I thank you for these things. And I pray it all in the precious name of the one who gave it all, Jesus Christ. And everyone together said, amen. Amen. Hey, brother. Uh, Before you go... I was sitting there and the Lord put on my heart what a joy it would be for us as a family to pray for our brother and his bride. So I want to ask you to join me in prayer as we pray for Pastor Dennis. Lord Jesus, our gracious, kind, good, great physician and our good shepherd. Jesus, I want to pray your blessing over Dennis and Heather. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your mercy and your care for Heather and, and the healing that's taken place and for all of the medical intervention that's taken place to help her fully recover. And Jesus, we know there's still a ways to go. And so Jesus, we want to continue to lift Heather up to you. And we also want to pray for Dennis. We pray, Lord, you'd continue to give him the strength, give him the patience, give him the encouragement as he helps his bride, as he walks together, as they walk together through this storm. And Jesus, we love you and we thank you that as one church that we can pray for each other. Lord, in confidence, knowing that you are good and that you are faithful, that you are loving. And we lift this up to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. What a wonderful message. Well, as I mentioned in our giving back time about our role as a church, as a sending church, Shoreline Church has the honor and privilege privilege of being able to send people out um, in the name of Jesus to wherever the world uh, they go and wherever the Lord sends them. And today is one of those days where we get to have a sending service as a time dedicated uh, where we actually are going to be praying over families, individuals who are leaving in the next three to four months. So if that's you today, whether you're here for the military or whether you are here as a student and you're getting ready to move off somewhere, whether you're a family that's moving, we would love to pray for it. It would be an honor for us to pray for you and to meet you and also for us to give you your very own Shoreline Church coin. Yes, I know the military has commander's coins, but we have the Shoreline coin. So if you are leaving, we would love to be able to pray for you because on the back of that coin, it actually reminds us that God is the one that's sending us 
sending you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts 1.8, that verse is on the back of those coins, reminding us that God is sending you out as his witnesses. And so please join us out here on the dock immediately after the service. We'd love to pray for you. For those of you that are new today, Thanks for coming to Shoreline. Thanks for joining us today, whether you joined us on campus or online. If you're new and you came on campus, we're going to ask you if you would go by the Connection Center just out these double doors there. They have a special gift for you. They just want to say thank you for coming. And those of you who are joining us online, if you just text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen there, we'd love for us to connect with you as well. And for those of you today that would love to have someone pray with you and to pray for you, we want to invite you to come forward to be prayed for. Pastor Dennis will be down here. And as you heard, the power of a praying church, Shoreline Church is a praying church. And many of you were praying for Pastor Dennis and for Heather in this process. And so today, here's my encouragement. If you're walking through a storm, you don't have to walk alone. We would love to pray for you. Our teams are ready and they would love to pray for you. If you're here on campus, come forward to the front of the worship center. If you're online, you can just go ahead and text your chat with your host, online host, or send in your prayer request to the email that you see on the screen there. So we would love to pray with you. And so if you would do me the honor and privilege, if you are able, would you stand here on campus and those of you who are watching online, as you go from this place, go in his peace Go in his strength and go in the joy, the joy that surpasses all. Go in his name. Have a great week and God bless you.